What's up, guys? Welcome to the Shooter Shoot Podcast, the podcast where we get personal with notable Winnipeggers. If you haven't been with us before, here's what you missed. I don't know. Like, what do you guys like to do? Like, do you guys masturbate before or after a shower? Oh, wow. I thought we would, like, kind I of like to jump right saddle in. in. And so music was kind of like, since I was young, like, since 10, 11, was, like, big. I can just go home and, like, be alone, but I have somebody in my ear the whole time. Four or five steps, <laughs> and then I, like, face planted and skid on the sidewalk, and the bus pulls up beside me. What is up, y'all? Welcome back to the Shooter Shoot Podcast. We got a brand new episode for you guys today. I mean, obviously, why else would you be here if we didn't have an episode, if it was just me rambling on and on? Anyways, not the point. Today's interview is with rapper Jordan Kelly, a.k.a. J. Kells. We talk about Transcona life, confidence in working hard, having a chip on your shoulder, and whether that's good for the city or not, his rap origins, his rhyming skills, and how meticulous he is with performing and putting out music, with all other kinds of stuff sprinkled in between, including Denzel LeBlanc and his bitch-ass podcast. Just kidding. Denzel's great. Check him out on social media. Today's episode, of course, as always, is brought to you by Jellyfish Float Spa. Jellyfish Float Spa is the best place in Winnipeg to experience the wonders of float therapy. Float therapy is where you lie in a pod with shallow water, it's about 10 inches, and a thousand pounds of Epsom salts. There, you literally float with water that is room temperature, that is skin temperature, so you don't feel it, and you disappear into the most relaxed state imaginable. I love going. I go whenever I can. I put it on my social media. I really love Liz and Roy. I really love Jellyfish Floats, Bob. Please check them out. They've been around since 2013. They're not just limited to float therapy. They got you covered with massage therapy and craniosacral therapy as well. If you use my code in the description below, the shooter shoot, you get 15% off any float there. Or if you just mentioned that you know me, it works about the same. That's any float, not just the first one. So go down there. It's 894 St. Mary's and get a discount on therapy today. We're here in the studio with Jordan Kelly, a.k.a. J. Kells. What's going on, man? Not too much. Thanks for having me, my man. Yeah, it's, I'm, it's going well. I always say I'm looking forward to every episode. For sure. For yeah. sure. Definitely this one. It's been a while since I've done anything. So, you know, I'm, I'm glad to be active again and just start sharing with everybody, too, and collabing with people in the city. So Yeah, for sure. When were you on Denzel's podcast? I know you did uh, that. Denzel's podcast, I think, maybe about three months ago now, when I first went with him. Uh, me and Denz go way back, too, just from, like, school and stuff, yeah. growing up in Transcona. So it was kind of cool to collab with him because we, like, been known each other before I was even doing music and yeah. stuff, too. So, you know what I mean? It was it was super easy, super casual. Like, it was, it was nice. I always roast Denzel because, like, <laughs> every time he tells me, he's like, yeah, I'd ask somebody to come out, and they're like, where do you live? And I give them the address, and they look it up, and they're like, they feel like it's the boondocks. Yeah. Right? That's what I mean. Everybody I meet too, like growing up, like I, I spent my bulk in Transcona, but I spent a lot of time around a lot of neighborhoods in the city. But whenever I would tell people about my place in Transcona too, it gets, it gets its rep, trash going and whatever. And yeah. people, people don't explore in there, but it's, it's a beautiful neighborhood too in the city. Like there's a lot to offer in Transcona too. So it's, it's actually, it's a fun space, man. Yeah. Well, he said like he gets people to agree to do it. Mm-hmm. And then they find out it's in Transcona and they're like, oh, I can't fucking back out now. Yeah, like, yeah, exactly. It's too late at that point. <laughs> and you've been in Transcona your whole life? Uh, no, not my whole life. Um, I moved around a lot, like as a kid, but I spent basically my bulk, like grade five to nine in there. Mm-hmm. Made like, a, you know, all my life with friends and stuff. And then um, we bounced back there. Like I did the whole basketball route all high school. We can get into a bit later, but I, I yeah. basically just ended up finishing my last semester of high school at Transcona just to graduate with like my homies and stuff. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah. And I know uh, my buddy was telling me about this, that you went out to play basketball after high school. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I played some college and stuff. Like, I kind of have a pretty complex ball ball path. Like, I was one of the first Winnipeg players to play in the States, too. So I, I just went to a prep school for my grade 12 year. I ended up playing a bit at University of Winnipeg here and just a couple of colleges in, like, Alberta and, and Ontario, too. So I was pretty heavy into that dream. And it's kind of actually what led me into going into the, the music direction. Yeah, when, so when, how... Straight out of high school, where did you go first? Which colleges? Uh, University of Winnipeg, University off the Winnipeg. jump. Yeah, yeah. Off the jump. Did you and Jamar do that together? Yeah, yeah, exactly. My boy Jamar. So, and that, that's who I'm doing a lot of this music with now, mm-hmm. too. So, it's, it just goes hand in hand. Like, that first year relationship we built, uh, just being the two youngest dudes sitting on the bench. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, that, that relationship there just built and lasted to this. And now we're just taking it over in the same way in music. Like, two yeah. guys who never had any experience in this stuff and now just kind of like i feel like leading the way for the city so yeah doesn't it kind of bother you looking <laughs> looking at uh the university of winnipeg now how they're like the new floor yeah the ring of honor and we it's talk like- about that all the time <laughs> honestly it's just like every every time you leave somewhere is when your schools upgrade even like the yeah. high schools and everything too but you can't hate like the new generation's getting it i guess so exactly. it's good for them but yeah i know what you mean i, I was just in there for the classic because we're actually coaching uh just jv ball in the city here or whatever yeah. and uh yeah 
it's like when we were coming up, it's just straight dead spots on the court. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? When I was in just... CMU, one of the guys told me when he was in high school, he used to lead guys onto certain areas of the court. Cause he yeah, because you knew the spots. Were. Exactly. If you, if you play enough on that old Duckworth court, you know about it for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then after U of W, where'd you go? You stayed there for a year? So, yeah, I stayed there for a year, did the first year with Jamar, and then I just made a, made a breakout to Ontario there, played college for a year out there. Where'd you play? Uh, it was called Seneca College. Oh, nice. So, yeah, you're very good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Not too bad of a team um you know we did the whole playoffs and stuff we didn't end up winning that year but it, it was a good experience just a different uh different mentality in toronto for ball even Big at time. a college level and and that's going down from cis but it's still a different uh intensity it's factor so when talented you're out there. the guys who are out there are there because either the grades aren't good enough exactly or they didn't put it together somehow mentally to, to get out, yeah, yeah to exactly. get out of or there. yeah, the grades, like you said, was a big thing too. Like we had a dude who I think he was like number one in the nation for scoring just because they keep track CCAA like mm-hmm. long like that, and it was just like I, don't, I couldn't I couldn't see why this guy couldn't just make that adjustment and go pro because like he's one of the best players I played with personally. So I'm just like it shows you how much your mental game really affects any occupation you have. To be honest, mm-hmm. if you if you don't have it mentally, it doesn't matter how good you are at anything. To be honest, I learned that in ball too. So. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. and a lot of those guys like failing those classes just so simple like they're just not going yeah exactly like i used to tell my i I went to durham and like i used to tell my guys like some of my teammates i'm like yo man you didn't get your shit signed for attendance yeah yeah. like no man yeah because i didn't go like why something that (laughs) simple exactly but you know everybody makes their own decisions that's that's part of the my biggest learning years were like in that college that up and down roller coaster ball and then you know really realizing it's not like high school you got to get your grades right with it and you start you start prioritizing your life like you're growing up in those states right so it's yeah mm-hmm. yeah i mean like i don't know i always found that to be super frustrating i mean uh, i've grown sure. out of that to just like not really care about what other people are doing that much yeah but like sure. as a team like as a teammate but yeah. doesn't that, wouldn't that annoy you Oh yeah, hundred percent. Especially when you're trying to build like a winning culture. I'm dealing with that right now, coaching that team that we're doing. You know what I mean? So like we're yeah. coaching a bunch of young kids at a JV level. It's hard to get everybody on the same page and realize that it's not just a hobby like anymore. Like this isn't grade nine basketball. This isn't grade eight basketball. It's a commitment. And if you yeah. aren't showing up for things, it affects like how you do on the team and stuff. So it's just it's hard. It's hard to get that level that message to anybody's head. It doesn't matter how old you are. It's really just about how much the the individual wants it, right? And you need like a good three, four leaders to put everybody in place. But if you don't have those three, four guys like leading the way, it's hard for everybody to see the vision. So, well, that's what I love about sports that it teaches you so much about life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It always translates. Yeah. Exactly. Because like, if you're not showing up, like what happens if you just call your boss and you're like, look, man, I'm just not going to show up to work today. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's what <laughs> I was saying. Cause everyone's like, I try to be a little bit harder on them. And you know, Jamar tries to be like, you know, more, more sympathetic with it. But I, but I try to tell them too, like it's, it's real life lessons we're teaching these kids as much as it's only JV basketball. So it's mm-hmm. like, you, you can't afford to do that in the real world. So it's, it's, it's a good balance between teaching them that and then still being lenient, you know, and understanding people are kids too. And people are, they're learning even when you get to the college level. So how can you bounce around? So like, how long were you at Seneca for? Uh, Seneca just a year as well. And then, uh, Lakeland just a year as well. It was just kind of just, I had a, I had a different roller coaster of playing in the states coming coming from my last year too, and then it was just it was just hard to really find that um, that system that I was in mm-hmm. growing up. Like I always had a certain way of playing. So coming back from the states, a lot of the Canadian schools kind of turned their eyes off of me, just thinking I wasn't coming back here. Mm-hmm. And then when it came back, my leverage was just a bit lower. So it's like I'm I'm working my way back up the system, but at the same time. I, I'm not understanding, you know, maybe lack of playing time, certain things you don't understand as just a young kid, because I'm just thinking, you know, I'm ready to do this stuff right now. So it was kind of, it was misunderstandings and just, you know, just trying to find my way on another team and stuff. And, and just, you know what I mean? I ended up just realizing I was only going to school to play basketball and spending that type of money to, to, to yeah. just play basketball and realizing that that thing adds up, that student loan, you know what I mean? So mm-hmm. after my third year, I kind of just said, you know, that's three different coaches, three, three paths that, you know, they, they did all right. I could play there. I could mm-hmm. finish out, but you know what I mean? Like, is this the best option for my overall life? Cause ball was all I really cared about for so long. I had to really just sit back and say like, you know, I'm, I'm turning 22 now. Like, 
what's what are we really going to prioritize on? You know yeah. I mean? So you're all you're the prep school, then you went to Transcona to finish. Yeah. UW, exactly. Seneca, Lakeland. Exactly. From like honestly 17 to like 20, 21 or so, I was just on the road, like just living on my own, playing at these schools, living on campus and whatnot. So you know what I mean. It was it was just a, a weird adjustment, but mm-hmm. you know what I mean. It's it, it's what built me into this guy I am today, at least. So you yeah, know what I, mean? I kind of understand that. Like not fully living on the road and all that, but like. For the past five years, five schools that I've been at have all been different. So, mm-hmm, like, grade 11, I was sure. at St. Paul's. Grade 12, I was at FRC. First okay, year, I was sure. at CMU. Last year, I was at Durham. Now, I just go to school at U of W. Well, like, it's weird trying to find a place that really sticks, hey? Exactly, because in every campus, is such a different, like, culture, too. That's what I realized, too. Like, the smaller colleges I go to, it's, it's more tight-knit like we were in high school. And then when you're at U of W, it's really just, like accountability like get get to those classes pass yourself like you know what i mean mm-hmm. no one's gonna hold your hand and slap your hand if, you, if you're not doing what you need to do so it's it's hard to adjust in those environments especially when now you, you get more freedom away from parents and whatnot too so you know what i mean and you're playing sports too people people look at people on the teams like a different way it's 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 a lot to balance out when you just like transitioning from high school to like real world mentality so yeah one of the things some my friend told me about you when you played high school ball because he's familiar with you you know uh, you and Jamar, his buddies with, and he knows kind of your basketball history. He oh, yeah, said sure. that the biggest thing about your game that stood off the page to everybody that you encountered, and he noticed this, some people would say, was that your confidence. He wow, said that sure. you made grown men feel uncomfortable when you went to go <laughs> play college ball because you were at a certain level in your mind, and if other people didn't think that they matched up, they would, they'd fucking suck. How did that translate from basketball to music to how you live your life in general? Uh, I'm, I'm just grateful for that. Like I, I started off like as a really unconfident basketball player coming up, to be honest, like mm-hmm. school wise, I would do my thing, but whenever we would go to higher levels in club, it would just be a challenge for me to actually step apart and, and stand out from these people. So to be honest, um, I guess just, you know, the way I was raised, my parents are a certain way, just like not necessarily out there as confident as me, but they, they stand for what they believe in too. So, so if you believe you're the best, I just feel like that's what you should do. And a lot of times even coming up, that was like certain things that hindered my career was, am I, am I borderline too confident? Is mm. it turning into cockiness now? Is it, is it whatever? Right. But I mean, I, I'm glad that I was that way then because it translated right into the music. And that's why my music transition happened so easily. Like it was just people recognize that confidence from basketball and they saw it was just the exact same thing when it came to this music. And I feel like that's why people really picked up with me, like from the jump like this. So. Yeah. Well, I think that's human nature to kind of get carried away one way or the other. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. For sure. And and honestly, I wouldn't even say too carried away. It's just like, if you put in the work and you're and you're confident in the work that you put in, I feel like, it's really, it's really other people's personal problems if they're yeah. if they're having a problem with the way that you're celebrating it with the, with the way that you enjoy the game, exactly. right? You know what I mean. So it was it was a good balance in that too. I dealt with that since I was kind of younger too, just growing up in Transcona for the bulk of it. Not a lot of people are diehard basketball players either, mm-hmm. right? So I was really one of the only guys putting in that type of work, and then. You know, parents, parents want to do, it's, it's a lot of fair play coming up in sports here. It's a lot of, it's a lot of that, which I agree with, but to a, to a degree, when you get a certain age, you got to stop that stuff because exactly. it doesn't encourage competitive behavior. It doesn't encourage people trying to push themselves to be better people, right? So, totally. so I dealt with that too, you know, parents saying ball hogs and these things, but you know what I mean? If you don't have that confidence, you can't, you can't get up on stage. You can't get up and do mm-hmm. these things. And, and without me going up on those stages, like, you know, Western Classic, big games and hitting big shots and provincial finals and these things going to the states and being on my own being in these colleges by myself that's why now i'll just go on the stage like it's nothing yeah that's the that's one of the least challenging things i've done in my life like you know what i mean the the more you experience the more that these like little fears that you come in with when you start in the game it just turns into nothing because you're like this is like this is light compared to what i've really dealt with so yeah yeah Mm -hmm. for sure i mean like when uh Holy fuck, I'm trying not to blank for some reason. I don't know why I'm blanking so hard. No, but like, uh, was there any, like, defining moment when you realized, like, yeah, like, I've got this killer mentality. Like, I have this From the basketball wise, right? Yeah, you know, honestly, um, I'd probably say I made my transition from just being, like, a, a decent player in the city to, like, really, really being confident in my skills from the grade 9 summer going into grade 10 there. I met a dude named uh, Michael Page, so shout out to him. He does yeah. academy basketball. Uh, he he trained with me every day. Like I, I would go to 5am, wake up, hit the YMCA on Kimberly, 
meet him there for about 6 a.m. We go 6 to 7 a.m. He drive me back to school. As soon as I got off school, I spent two hours at the gym at Garden City, bus over to Victor Major, spent another two hours training with him like clockwork. Like we mm-hmm. were just putting in so much work in that grade 10 year. And that just made the transition for me. My jumper just became way more consistent. Like, you know what I mean? Everything just started clicking just off like that. And ever since that point on, that's when people started recognizing it too. It wasn't just like me in my own head saying like, you know, I could be something, I could make the league. It was just more people actually like recognizing the talent and recognizing the work I put in. So that that just motivated me to do more. So Yeah, I'm glad I mean, you talked about the confident thing and believing in yourself. Because I believe everybody who's confident has to be overconfident at some mm-hmm. point. That has to, it's not just like, oh, it's bad to be overconfident. No, no, there are certain points, I think, where you have to be overconfident. Sure, sure you might sure. you might choose the wrong situation. you got to rein yourself in a bit. But one of the things, two episodes ago, Sam Cohn was talking about how, you know, he was talking about his business and he was talking about his app. And he mentioned to me before we were recording that uh, there was somebody there at a previous... Uh, it, there's this award for young entrepreneurs and in a, a previous year they were talking about how somebody asked this guy for his brand, like, how is this going to hold up? Mm-hmm. What separates you from other people who oh, might have a similar idea? Because it's not like his idea was like super groundbreaking. Or yeah, yeah, super somebody, innovative. Yeah, something somebody, out the box. but Somebody never thought of before. Yeah, exactly. But he's, his answer was, I am the brand. Mm-hmm. Like, look at me. This is the brand. You're yeah, looking yeah. At it. Nobody exactly. can do it the way I can do it. Nobody's going to do it as well as I will. Uh-huh, and that's sure. the perfect answer. Yeah, that's a perfect mentality to have. Like that's that's exactly how I feel it too. Like you you got to be confident you're the best in your environment or that you're on the way to it because if you're just in it for fun, no offense to anybody who just wants to have fun. I love to have fun too, but if we're not striving to be the best in it, then we're not pushing the next generation to do that. And that's that's what really should be the goal is that I'm going to spark, not to sound like on my Tupac or nothing, but like, <laughs> I'm going to spark the next dude from Winnipeg to actually think it's not just whack to be a Winnipeg rapper. Of it's course. not just whack to be a Winnipeg person, period. Like traveling around the country in, in America and certain places I've been to, whenever you hear from, oh, you're from Winnipeg, where's that? Oh, you're from Winnipeg. Oh, it's, it's is cold that close there. To it's Toronto? Winnipeg. Yeah, exactly. It's just it has such a stigma to it that I just I just feel like this place has such potential that we need more people to step up and just be out of the box instead of being comfortable in this like kind of traditional Winnipeg life. You get trapped in your neighborhood. You know what I mean? You might not even head to the south if you're from the north side. You might yeah. not head to the other side if you're from the south. And it's just like for such a small like tight knit community like a small town mindset that we have we're, we're still so separated and we don't we don't collab the way we should so i feel like it's just going to take more of us popping up and just more leaders and creative people like we have like that and it's happening it's happening slowly but you know the more we do that the the better chance that our city has and the next generation has to just not get stuck here and just get stuck in the the nine to five grind that you just have to do to survive here so for sure that's there's a ton of good fucking points in there holy shit i'm gonna say this specifically Mm -hmm. especially on previous episodes like i remember quinn baskin talking about this on our episode and i told this to a bunch of people and this is actually one of the reasons for creating this whole podcast and making it winnipeg based and talking about how great the city is and we want local Mm -hmm. sponsors and we want local business partners and we want people to realize what we got going on i think a lot of people in the city have rich expectations and rich people dreams but they have a broke mentality when it comes exactly. to achieving that. Oh, well, Winnipeg would be better if we had this. Well, we got an opportunity to do this. Oh, well, that's going to cost wanna just, money. Don't want to put the work in to do it, exactly. Yeah, well, Winnipeg sucks because it's not Toronto. Winnipeg sucks because it's not Vancouver. But well, that was Toronto just five years exactly. ago. Exactly. You know what I mean? And that that's the funny thing that you bring that up because that's really how... It was for us too. Like we we weren't getting any shows when I first started with this, and I just I saw so many people getting a little carbone show, getting a little slot slot here. You know what I mean? And they ain't bringing in no three hundred people. I'm like, why are these guys not giving me no shows? They see I'm putting out songs. They see I'm doing this too. And it and it just comes down to just having the initiative to come and do it yourself. So like I'll just bring up a story of what we did in in 2017. Um, Nobody was booking for shows. The only thing I did was maybe one dude's EP release party, a little 50 minute set. And we just mm-hmm. said that like enough's enough. We hit the Russ concert, tried to throw him some USBs. He kind of had a little rant on stage, you know, kind of dissed it. It really touched me inside. And I just said, I'm, I'm going to be the one on the stage talking on the mic. The next time that I'm in a venue, yeah. I'll be the one with that mic. Hit up the Goodwill. They weren't the first ones I hit up by any means. I hit up the damn rooftop tab. I hit up the Met. 
end up like not to name drop all these businesses that should have done business with us, but it's okay. You know Your episode, I mean? like, say what you want. Exactly. You know what I mean? So like we, we hit up a few venues. Goodwill got back to us with a reasonable price. We booked that and we were in business in like four months and, and made money off the very first show we ever threw. And that's full control. That's bringing, you know, put on other artists, let them open up. Like that's just, that's the stuff we need to do is just start having the initiative to, to do these things and let these other things come to us. These sponsors can come to us. These other people can come to us once they see what we've already yeah. kind of brought to the city ourselves. You know what I mean? I think a lot of times just in the creative industry, we're all looking for that one cosign that could change it. That one thing that could just change it instead of just changing our immediate situation. And then them saying, you know, like I could kind of use some of that and I, and then maybe I can use some of their help too. It, it's got to be always a mutual yeah. relationship though. But a lot of times like, in this city, it is what you said. It's just, it's very like a kind of, I forget my train of thought, but you know what I mean? Yeah, it's just, yeah, it's, it's a really, mentality. really looking for, looking for something instead of just being the ones to pave that way here. And I think we need more people to pave the ways for us because we're so far behind already as it is. So. Yeah. Well, here's something that uh, I think a lot of people don't realize is that uh, everybody loves a come up story only when it's finished. Exactly. <laughs> Nobody wants to take a risk on something because it might fail. Like, exactly. you're talking about how you wanted to book shows and, you know, people were getting shows and they weren't even selling out the venue. And you booked with the Goodwill and you hustled and you worked and you made a profit. So mm-hmm. people just need to give you that chance. Like, let me yeah, ask you this. See that, see that success for yourself first, you know what yeah. I mean? And, and you also can't take these things personally is what I realized because when I first started doing this, every time that somebody wouldn't collab, every time that it wasn't working out in my favor, I would take that to heart and I'd be like, all right, just know when I get to this level... I'm not messing with you then. Yeah. And that's not the mentality to have with it. You know what I mean? You you need to prove things too. You need to not be scared to pay dues because that's a lot of what, what maybe even hindered my basketball career. Going back to that is, yeah. you know what I mean? Have your confidence. Be be aware that you can do great things, but still have the, the humbleness to pay the dues and to just show things even when you don't feel that you need to show that. You know what I mean? Even if you don't need to show it, show that anyways and then... You know what I mean? That's more leverage on your side anyway. So, Well, let me ask you this. I, you're a basketball fan, obviously. Do you know NBA, oh, yeah. I'm assuming? For sure. Okay. For sure. So, Toronto, let's talk Toronto. Because mm-hmm. everybody, we talk Winnipeg, and this is local, we're going to talk Winnipeg a bunch. Let's look at the other cities for comparison. For sure, for sure. Toronto is popping now. Mm-hmm. Toronto's blowing up now in social media, the hip-hop world, now basketball as well. What changed? Like, what made it great? And I kind of have an idea, correct me if I'm wrong, I think Drake kind of put Toronto on the map. Yeah, for sure. He definitely, like, they had their little runs to to at least make it relevant to all of us in Canada first. Mm -hmm. But Drake's definitely that, like, deciding factor of of pushing, you know, like, celebrities wanting to actually come to the city. Don't get me wrong, it's a great city. It's always been. But, like, now it's worldwide. Mm -hmm. He's a court side of the Raptors game. People now notice the Raptors. Like, exactly. There is like a people want to be at the games too now. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Like, and especially since they're good. Mm-hmm. Like, Toronto's now a global city. And now there are young rappers, you know, there are the SoundCloud rappers and there are people coming up. They get a lot more support now because, oh, you're from Toronto? Shit. Okay. Yeah, let cool. me check that cosign. Exactly. And that's, and that's because people made their waves though. And that's why I respect Drake. Like, I, I've been a fan of a lot of hip hop legends, but Drake especially just because it's a relatable story to me. It's something I can trace back. I can use his blueprint. It's somebody who's mm-hmm. like not just so street that I can't really, I can't relate to coming up off of drug money. No offense mm-hmm. to drug money people or anything, but you know what I mean? I can only relate to what I, what I see. Of course. And, and what he's done, it's just like, it's amazing to see that he started his own wave and then brought it back to Canada. Like he went out to Houston, he went and did these things and networked and, and, and met these people but still never forgot where he came from and brought it all back. Because even if you go back to the first three years, he Drake was still one of the biggest artists in the world at that time, but it wasn't influential enough to bring that love to Toronto. Yeah. And it just took every little building block, like even the Blue Jays having their playoff run the year they had. And then the next year, Raptors having their playoff run. And then not to mention, Drake keeps climbing and climbing and climbing. Yeah. And then you got Tory Lanez just slowly coming up on his on his stuff as well. It, it's all just like a, a system working, but that's like a city working together. So, like, unknowingly to me, like, you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, and like, he embraces the city. Mm-hmm. Like, let's say 10 years down the road when you're popping off, you're at a Jets game. Jets become a million times more popular. And, I mean, obviously, this is a hockey town and Toronto's a basketball city and they, they yeah, love the teams. Sure. But, like, here's my comparison of it. Everybody in Canada knows Vancouver is a great city. And it is. 
But how many people outside of Canada know it as a great city? It'll come up second or third when people list Canadian cities. Yeah, but exactly. Like, when you hear Americans talk about this, and when I was in Brazil a while ago, and there was I was at World Youth Day, a huge worldwide event, uh, a lot of people asked me where you're from. I said Canada. Toronto? No. Mm-hmm. And yeah, most of them the couldn't even. Question. Yeah, most of them couldn't even come up with a second city. But if they could, Vancouver. Yeah, no. exactly. And if there was a third, it was Montreal. But compare Toronto and Vancouver. Everybody knows Toronto. Some people know Vancouver. I think that's the Drake effect. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That is for sure. There's not enough, not enough people bringing it back to the city in Vancouver because a lot of people are using that place just, you know, a vacation spot, mm-hmm. these rich people and whatnot too because it's so taxed out there. But yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. that. That Drake effect is real and I feel like that's why I'm so confident in this music that I'm doing just because I, I compare my story so much to, to his and I feel like I could really open that door for the city. Like, the city, the city has such potential. You, you see oh, yeah. it every day. You see, like, what could happen and it's just like it's about people really getting to the top levels of the city and then coming together and really shaping it the way it's supposed to and i just i just don't think we have the right leadership in the city right now to do it but with time and and with people just working on their own crafts whether it's music whether it's sports whether it's whatever it is we have more athletes going out playing in d1 now playing in playing wherever else you know what i mean we have singers now going and doing festivals and, and doing whatever in other other places but we can't really put this city on just online as much as online such a big presence nowadays these people need to meet us they need to see us you need to get out you can't just put your city on always from raid in the city especially in a small market like here so that's why i just i'm glad there's people really branching out and doing it It, it, we got so much more to go but i see the potential in every day and i see us like really chasing it i just think it's just a matter of like 10 15 years before the city kind of reaches that that Toronto-esque at least because really the only places in Canada you can even go see a rap concert are like Vancouver, Calgary or you know maybe Edmonton every Mm -hmm. now and then in Toronto so it's like we're always constantly getting skipped amongst his prairies because people don't even know the places they don't know the cities yeah they don't realize there's people here that can make money off of too you know what I mean we're just as big of fans as, as anybody else so I think it's just about you know showing that we have talent here we have culture here and then you know, just letting the time do its thing, basically. Yeah, and I, I want to one-up you on that. You said 10, 15, let's go five years. Why not five? Why can't, exactly. we, be, why can't it be? Exactly. Why can't we be a five? I know we're supposed to reach a million people by 2030. Mm-hmm. Like, how many people... Here's my example of things in the States. Even some places in the States get overlooked. Like, there's New York, there's L.A., but if people aren't very cultured, then they won't know places outside of New York, California, yeah, yeah, Texas. Right. All the other but there's states. a lot of great places inside the states that are recognized in America. That's where I think Winnipeg can be in five years. Mm-hmm. We can be recognized, you know, I think is federally the right word. Like within the country, yeah. we can definitely be recognized as a big market. Yeah, for sure. Nationally, for sure. The thing nationally, is, too, like we, we got little things going for us, too, though. Like even... Watching like the whiteout last year with the Jets, like that, that was something crazy to see because there's just been nothing in Winnipeg in my 23 years of life that I've ever seen that has brought that many people in Winnipeg together. Like nobody could do that besides that hockey team right now. And that's a great thing, but that just shows how, how little we support other things around the city. There's tons of great things happening all the time. Mm-hmm. And if we can get 20K sitting out there on cold days, to watch these guys win in the playoffs and we need to also just think to ourselves personally like what can i do to not help my community mm-hmm. what can i do to help the next guy you know what i mean and and that's a big thing of swan your pride as an artist too because as an artist sometimes you you get wrapped in the mindset like i'm not a consumer but at the same time the more we support each other in the creative games the better example we're setting for people who are just watching the people who are watching us right now you know what i mean yeah so, that, that's how I feel about it, at least. Like, we, we just have to continue to support our, our other artists, our other creative people, and just as much as we would our sports teams, as much as we would our big name events, because that's the only way we get anything done. I'm sure New Year's, like, was good at, you know, Anchor was saying, like, the Met was really popping night, yeah. but how much more popping of a night would it be if everyone just has the like mindedness to really get into one space? There's probably, like, so, so many people at the Met. So many people at 441, so many people at OV, so mm-hmm. many people at a house party, all the, so many people so spread around when we could really, you know, come together as a city like Toronto does on New Year's. Downtown is just lit and everybody's down there. It doesn't matter if you've been gone in the club. You're going to have a good night just sitting on the strip there. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Here it's just like 
we all get stuck in our habits in our own little comfort zones, I feel like. And it's just about trying to like inspire people to break out of those comfort zones because you don't want to be stuck in Winnipeg in this freezing cold till you're 70, hating your life. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like we, we want to make the most out of this city and, and it has enjoyable moments. So we got to really start emphasizing those more, I think. Yeah, of course. I think, I think the city has insane potential. Mm-hmm. I think it's got insane potential to be great, but it has, everything has, a shadow, of course. So whatever potential it has to be great, it also has equal potential to be terrible. Like, well, can you imagine sure. if people in Toronto were like, we're not even in America, man. Yeah, it's uh, even New I York. Don't, I don't even it's like, you know, like New York. Yeah, like, <laughs> what, if, what if Drake was like, man, but I'm from Canada. Mm-hmm, I can't believe I'm that. from there. No, fuck. Like, I think Winnipeg has got so much potential and we're growing so rapidly mm-hmm. and there's so much going on. Like, that's what I love about doing this is I learn something new about every single avenue every day. Yeah, exactly. Talking to so many different yeah, like, and, industries too. Uh-huh. So, you know. And like, who's to say that you can't throw a, a huge rap concert in a year? Exactly. Who's that. to say that you won't be selling out Bell MTS Place in five, ten years? Mm-hmm. And that comes, that just comes with us starting to chase these dreams and turn them into realities though. Like I said, like, it takes all of us taking the initiative and, and realizing that, like, we're not all professionals yet. You know what I mean? We're all trying to get to a certain pinnacle mm-hmm. right now. So, so the thing I experienced coming up was a lot of like money exchanges in this, in this stuff. And it's just like, if we can all just worry about that part of it after and really, like you said, go and throw a big concert in this city, like all these local shows, if, if somebody goes and sees one local show and there's 10 people in the crowd, Next time they get invited to a local show, they're probably a little hesitant about it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So instead of all of us just trying, like, I'm going to just throw in together whatever I can do. Hopefully we get 20 people in the door. Or just, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Let's really focus on the execution of these things and making this, making, we got to make it seem it's a certain way before it really gets to that point. You know what I mean? If mm-hmm. we're not projecting a certain image, a certain, like, professionalism, a certain quality to it then what's what's really the point because we're just going to be turning off people as we go and then now we're two steps back from from where we just gained like you know what i mean definitely so, most definitely i mean mm-hmm. i really think that if people focused on what we we're doing and really like believed in what people were trying to do here the city would take off mm-hmm. and it wouldn't look back like just from a quick sports standpoint the jets are huge obviously mm-hmm. one of the best teams in the nhl however the Bombers are really popular as well. Yeah, oh yeah. And I mean, sure. the CFL is kind of hanging in the balance with the American leagues going on, but we just got the CPL, mm-hmm. and there's a new basketball league being introduced in this summer. Well, I, called, I haven't heard of that. Exactly. Yeah, right. I, I stumbled upon them by accident. It's called the Canadian Elite Basketball League, and they're trying to cover coast to coast instead of just doing what the NBL yeah, did. The NBL just over on that East Coast. Thing. Basically, yeah. yeah. But they've got teams in Fraser Valley, Guelph, uh, Hamilton, where else? Niagara, Saskatoon, and Edmonton. Mm-hmm. If that's if they come to Winnipeg, I think Winnipeg is got a great untapped basketball market. Oh yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. But uh, then again, you know what I mean. It's just about these venues and stuff, and just getting getting everybody on the same por- board and getting these like people the right places to play and making it a good experience for the fans, right? Because it took it took a while for everybody to really get behind the Bombers. Even when we had the St. James Stadium, it was a little rough to get. Once it started getting any sort of winter weather on, you know what I mean? It was it was hard for people to get down Empty. there. Now they got the big Elise Arena over by U of M. They got like a reason. Oh, let's make it an event. You know, uh-huh. like we, we can really make it a night out of it. So it's like. That just comes with us as consumers coming and supporting these new these new opportunities that come to the city, and then you know what I mean. The people that are really trying to throw these things, executing, like I said, and really just thinking about, am I making this the best experience for for the city right now? Like you know what I mean. So it's it's about us just getting on the same page. But as that's gonna be that's gonna be tough for the city. I'm definitely catching the games. So. Totally, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. As much as it is though on the people to support, I think it also is on the creators to branch out. Oh yeah, for like sure. I was talking, to, I was talking to Keo. She was on the last episode. She asked me, like, if you want, come out to LA with me. Mm-hmm. Come see what LA is like. Come see what Toronto. I'm going to Toronto next summer. She's like, I can link you up with people. We can talk. Like, let's go to New York. Go to Atlanta. Go yeah, to these places. Like, branch out. Yeah. Figure out what the best possible way to work is. Mm-hmm. Like, if we're not producing products that are accessible, like they might be good, but like, how are we utilizing social media? How are we advertising? How exactly. are we relating to people? How are we doing what people are interested in? Like, I, I met with uh, Armin Irenpour from uh, Leo Press, mm. and he was talking to me about how can you make your podcast something that people want to listen to, not just something that you think is dope. Yeah, exactly. Because if you think it's dope, that's great. However, you want people to listen. This isn't just... If it was just something that I was like, you know what, fuck it, 
I'm just podcasting with my buddy and we'll put it on iTunes and if nobody really yeah. listens, I don't give a fuck. But if you want it to be something that people in the city can you get want behind, to progress for sure. it needs to be consumable. People need to get behind it. Mm-hmm. Exactly, exactly. And that's what I'm saying. Like, it's just really about that execution on our side of it, too. Because, you know what I mean? We can't blame the consumers, like you said. It's it, it's on us to inspire that support. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And that's why it's just like, mm-hmm. I've been only doing this really since 20, like the end of 2016 there. And it's just like, it's just been trial, error, trial, error. And that's why it's just like, that's what I love about the process of it is just like, I get to make these dope projects, these songs, these, these like cover arts, these things I get to just create and create and then just test it out on the market. Is this going to be the one that makes it happen? All right. That's not the one. Let's go back to the drawing board. Okay. Let's put a, a whole concept behind this song, this video, this whatever. Right. And then we go and we do it again and we just keep going. And I've gotten to see it like really go on its roller coaster ride of like high, high support to not so much on the next and just really learn from all those mistakes. And you know what I mean? And just, keep building it up until eventually you really get to your to the point you want to be at so yeah so how did you start the rap game like you said end of 2016 what made you kind of think that you wanted to do it so so realistically like i started rhyming words just off the poetry unit like back in junior high so like i just i i knew i had a somewhat skill for it i just used to write like love poems on the lows like for the for the girls in junior high and stuff so (laughs) i just knew i had a knack for rhyming words for sure because everybody reacted like a certain way back then with them and then just growing up in Tikona, like I said, like, for the most part, when I was coming up, I was one of the only black people there, like, especially from that, like, grade five to to right before we hit high school and whatnot. So whenever we were all chilling, like, we every now and then, my boys would just be like, hey, like, you know what I mean? Like, not to not to feed into stereotypes and stuff, but like, hey, can you rap? Like, can you, yeah. can you do it one, two bar and stuff? Like, that's just kind of stuff that came up growing up there. And then when we started, like, kind of drinking in high school and, you know, you're doing that type of thing, I'm, I started just freestyling. Mm-hmm. And then these guys, you know, are reacting. I'm just doing one, two lines here or there. And they're just reacting, like, nice off of it. So I'm, I'm, my confidence is building. My confidence is building. And these are, like like I said, like my lifelong friends. So we're, we're spending so much time throughout the years. And this is just my basketball time. Like, I'm not even, like, thinking music at all. I'm just, like, whenever I have to chill with my boys, it's sick. We'll have a couple of drinks. We'll freestyle. It's just a fun thing to do. And throughout that, like, two years of doing that before I ended up going to um, Ontario for that college, yeah, it just built up so much to the point I was, like, freestyling for 10 minutes straight, 20 minutes straight, just going off. Like, no one could stop me from doing it. So then when I came back after that third year of college and just kind of said, like, what do I really want to do? Like, what's my next move? Basketball's not really going the way I thought it'd be my third year in college and whatnot. I just, you know what I mean? Looked up. I, I figured out everyone used to always say, like, man, you're so sick off the top of the head. Why don't you ever just try and really put something together in the studio? We hit up Google, like, I want to say maybe no November 2016, like the very beginning. Mm-hmm. We hit up Google. Hit up Google, just started looking up, um, you know, studios around the city. I found Studio 11. Uh, we booked it that night. And then I honestly dropped my first track like eight days later. So like Damn. November 8th. And then just since then, I've just been learning the whole social media game, learning like the promo side of it, just re- learning that it's really just a lot more than the music to it to, to progress it. So. so do you think it's more, I mean, obviously, I mean, this kind of goes with everything. Mm-hmm. Do you think it's a natural talent or do you think it's something anybody can build up? I think it's a bit of both. Yeah. Just because I've seen it on both ways, like as an athlete and as a, as a artist too. Um, there, there's natural talent to it for sure. Cause I've seen guys put in as much work as they can. And it's just, you might not have that rhythm though. You know what I mean? Like there's certain, certain natural skills you get off of it. You might just not have that natural ear to the beat. Like I don't count bars or anything. Like I don't know nothing about the music side of it necessarily. Just what I've learned throughout this process. And, uh, and I, it's, it's that natural talent, but if you don't continue to work on it, you're still not going to get to the level you want because as much as I could freeze off the top of the head and it comes naturally to me, the writing process that I did coming up is why now I'll hear any beat and I can be like, all right, that's where I'm going to put the chorus. That's where I'm going to put the bridge. That's where I'm going to put the, and that just came from continually writing different songs to different beats. And then, you know, not necessarily knowing technically, oh, this is the chorus because this is spaced out here and here. It was just me kind of hearing so many different beats, being like, okay, when a beat changes like this, probably want you to switch up your flow to this and just like learning off of myself like that. Yeah. So 
Do you make beats or you just rap and do you nah. find beats? Yeah, I just I just find beats. Like when I was first starting, I uh, I was really on that whole YouTube to MP3, just converting a lot of beats over and just mm-hmm. trying to make as much music to that as possible. That. Oh yeah, for sure. I, I mess with it. There's a lot that you can get for free and stuff too. But I just started, like I said, I started really looking into the game of it, and there's mm-hmm. so much copyright restrictions and all that type of stuff. So it just started. I started realizing I can only take that music so far. Like even if I wanted to throw that music on your podcast. You, you know, you could end up, that producer might see it, might be like, hey, man, why use my music on the podcast? Yeah, and then our beats like, are produced. Like, I know the guys, we mm-hmm. went to high school. So the beats oh, that yeah. I use, we change up the format a little bit. We don't have uh, as many beats on every episode, but we just have one when I read the ad out. Oh, okay, okay. So the sure. beats are produced by guys I went to high school with. Exactly, yeah. So that's what I mean. Like, I started realizing you need things that you own or that you know the people in. It's not, like, these issues because you don't want, like, to put so much effort into, into a song and that be the song that changes things for you and then it just also drops you down just as fast because mm-hmm. there's legal things into it and there's people who are old things and all and all that type of stuff that i heard and i just really study the game just up at youtube interviews and all these things right so it's just like yeah you know what i mean it's just about just just focusing on that part of it and just just realizing it's more than just your craft it's it's everything that comes into it to help you progress into it so that's interesting that's so interesting that you talked about the poetry thing when you were mm-hmm. young because i first real i never honestly knew what rapping was about i thought that it was planned oh, okay. i thought it was planned and people wrote and wrote and wrote a lot a lot of artists do though a lot of artists do and i write it and do it right so it's like uh-huh it's really just based on that specific artist but at the same time it's just like it's a it's a nice kind of um gift to just just be able to also just hear a beat and like i have certain songs like that i've just freestyled the entire thing and that's that is a lot less frustrating than my writing process because when i write i hear the beat i'll play 10 seconds of it write the first two lines run it back say those first two lines then write another 10 seconds to it and that should, that can get tedious like after a while you know so it's just like it's it's about what you're more comfortable with, but I think everybody, if you if you're even doing this music thing as a rapper, you should really just try and freestyle when you got a chance with your boys. When you when you have that time to learn and you're not getting judged because when you have that at your disposal, it doesn't matter if Lil Wayne walked down in this basement right now. I'm ready to rap for him. Yeah, you know what I mean. It doesn't matter what time of the day it is. I'm ready to rap for these guys just because. I'm such a fan of the hip hop game and the wordplay of it that like in coming up in trans corner, the way I said, it just, it, it was almost like I subliminally trained myself to be ready for that situation. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's, it's just, it's a good gift to have, but at the same time, when you write, you have such control over it too. So it's, it's really both, both things you need. Yeah. I, well, I think at least I didn't right. realize the high level skill of freestyling. I mean, obviously I knew what freestyling was and like, you know, Emmanuel Acott. Yeah. Oh yeah. For sure. When we played club basketball together. Okay. And we had a rap battle when we went to a tournament in Chicago. And I was, sure. I was fucking terrible. <laughs> but it, was, it was funny because I wasn't that good. And ACOT was getting scholarships and he was trying to rap battle everyone. And so yeah, it's funny yeah, that I was, sure. I was like the lowest guy on the team and I tried to... That, the point is, I first started realizing that when I was in college last year at Durham and I was playing video games with my homeboy and he just started rapping about what we did yesterday or the mm-hmm. day before. And I was like, holy shit, like... It never seemed so obvious to me before, you know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. No, I agree. That's that's the thing about freestyling too. It's always more raw. It's just it's really coming from the heart. It's really mm-hmm. coming from the head, and that's and that's what I like about it too. Is I got I got those reactions because whenever I would freestyle at those parties, I would be saying like something. You maybe you see something on the mm-hmm. wall. Maybe you see it's it's so much easier to make somebody feel something if it's something they see. That's something they relate to. Something, something right they, there. Yeah, right there in the moment. Exactly, and it's like. That's why even with the writing process, it's been it's been kind of cool to learn things because it's like a lot of times when I first started making music, it was just geared to Winnipeg people, just to this city, which isn't a bad thing. This is where I'm from, and I'm proud of that. But at the same time, you got to realize, like like you said, people relate to what they see, what they mm-hmm. what they're into. So how do I expect Houston to start rocking with me? How do I expect Edmonton to start rocking with me? How do I expect Vancouver to start rocking with me? Mm-hmm. If I don't learn about where they're from, if I don't learn their things, and then yeah. the more experiences you get, the more shit you have to talk about, you know what I mean? So that's that's where it comes to it. I, I like freestyling in the moment with somebody and just talking about their shirt and seeing like, oh, damn, he's going he's gonna to bring that up? Mm-hmm. Like it, It's it's such a an easy trigger for people if you really just come at them that way. I've even thought about, you know, like, maybe hitting Toronto in certain places and just being that dude on the street who kind of stops you freestyles with you and like kind of do that for content purposes or even just like, you know what I mean? To uh-huh. go branch out like, cause, cause a lot of the, a lot of the game for musicians now too is so online. It's like, 
you can build your, your social media presence and you can build a lot of fans from other places online. And I see that. I see the proof of that these days. But at the same time, like, there's nothing more intimate than just coming in with that person face to face. You know what I mean? Like, but yeah, you know, it's just, it's just so much more intimate and personal to, to do that. And I miss, like, I miss that generation of, of being able to just pass my mixtapes out and just be selling it out of the trunk and do these things. And, and that's kind of the people who inspired me. So I, I wanted to like be a good balance of the new school people and, and really gaining your fan base online and learning that game of it, but still not forgetting the roots of like how this whole hip hop thing came about and how it was so hand to hand face to face like that. So yeah. I, have you ever done that? Like just gone, I'm sure you have just like gone to other cities and checked out what they got going on over there. Uh, not necessarily because like, to be honest, like when I started this music, it was when I was kind of making my return to Winnipeg. Like when I was just kind of really mm. planting back here, just trying to get my finances back and just like really start thinking what my next move was. So I haven't really gotten to travel like how I want to, to, to explore this music scene and like, you know, the different parts of that of it. But, um, you know, like this summer, I have certain plans for this year coming up, especially to just network outside like that and just like, you know, really see what the different scenes are in Vancouver and Toronto and certain places and just make my mark there. And, and like I said, like freestyle was really what brought me into this thing in the first place. So I think that's going to be a big, big help for me. Like when I'm out in these places and I meet these new people, it doesn't matter if it's Lil Wayne, it could be somebody sitting in New York who just happened to really be messing with my freestyle that night who followed me the next day and put me on to whoever they know, you know what I mean? So it's just have, like... Have you had that happen to you where people just message you and they heard of your music or they message you out of nowhere and be like, hey man, I just heard your music? Yeah, yeah, a few times for sure. Like, just because I, I have a lot of boys from other cities too just because of playing basketball in those different provinces. Mm-hmm. So so every now and then, like, a couple of their boys will hit me up if they catch me through the wind of them. But yeah. for, for the most part, like, my, my bulk of my fan base is really in the city here. Like, I got a good solid, solid amount of people who rock with my stuff and then... You know what I mean? I'm just slowly chipping away at the other markets, like as I go. But um, yeah, I've had a few, few definitely. A lot of, lot of, lot of young artists will hit me up too, like from the city who are just coming up for the first time, or maybe they're just looking to drop their first track and kind of ask advice too. I, I mess with that too because if there, if there was a way someone could have told me all the little things that I made mistakes of doing in the beginning, it would have been just great to have and just like where where the money should be getting invested to first and, and just things like that, all the little details I like helping like other artists with because it, it's it's never going to hurt one of us to have somebody make it. It's just going to open the doors for all of us anyway. So you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah, you're right. Supporting people and giving back and, you know, supporting other artists who want to jump on a track or want to pick your brain and talk to you. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've You talked about the Goodwill show. How many shows have you done in Winnipeg? Uh, so I've probably done like five total, I'll say. Yeah. I threw two myself at the Goodwill. So one 2017, one 2018. Uh, opened up for a couple of Afrobeats artists. So a guy named Muzo, uh, another guy named Official Bentamana. Uh, but yeah, probably, I'd say about four or five. Um, mm-hmm. not, not too many or anything, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Like for me, for me, I think, um, a lot of people oversaturate in shows here. And, and I just feel like it's only so much support you can ask from the same people, mm-hmm. right? So if I'm keep tapping in every weekend, like buy this ten dollar ticket, come support me, buy this ten dollar ticket, come support me. I'd rather just, hey, hold up. Come check me in June. I'm putting on a big ass show for you like we were talking about earlier, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? I put all my bread into it. I put the production, I get everything right so that the next time that something comes up, it's not like, oh well yeah, he's just going, you know, back and forth with the mic one more time. We should go check yeah. it. It's it's more so like, all right, okay, we got something to really see because the last time you had a show, you really went all in with it. You know what I mean? So I think, I think on my personal experience of, of coming up with shows, uh, it's just too much, too many things here get half assed. And I just want to like really put, put an emphasis on throwing like the best show that comes in 2019. And that's what, that's what I'm doing this year. I'm not, I'm not planning on doing any openings, any performances. I'm just throwing my own show, um, in the summertime and we're going to, we're going to make it like a real event here. You and know it's just going to be you. Uh, not not just me uh, performing. Like I always, whenever I do throw these shows, I like to uh, just get new artists to open up still and, and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Just because it, it obviously builds relationships amongst the local people, and it just it just gives younger dudes an opportunity to get their shine too. But um, I just mean like I'm gonna put it's gonna be just me throwing it. But you know what I mean. I'm gonna involve as many people as I can, as long as like my music to me was the biggest thing for doing music or doing basketball was the fact that you have the freedom that you don't necessarily have in a job, right? So you just have that freedom to 
to the financial freedom to live your life how you want. And I, I feel like my music, I translate just right into my life and every relationship that comes as an artist, I treat it the same way I would as just any friendship, any person coming up to me on the street. So as long as like we're treating each other with respect, that's, that's what it's about. But if not, then you know what I mean? I treat it the same way. I just cut it off and I move to the next because that stuff will just hold you back in, in, in your art. It'll hold you back in your life and, and anything. If you just, if you don't demand to be treated the way that you want to be treated and then treat people that same way. So yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah you got to be consistent with your actions. Mm-hmm. You can't exactly. just be fucking around or saying one thing and then not being consistent with it or, you know, bullshitting people. Exactly. It's, Especially in a small place. It's like so this, important man. to be authentic. If, if it's a small, like I said, like Winnipeg is sometimes like a small town mindset. So you know what I mean? Like as much as it's very important to not let other people's opinions, like, dictate who you're going to be you still need to realize reputation means a lot anywhere in the world you Mm -hmm. know what i mean and if you're in a a small closed space where you rely on support like i'm saying so much and that's why i emphasize support i rely on support so if i'm in a smaller market like i am right here and i'm burning bridges left right and center i'm putting myself like 10 steps down from getting out of a place that's already 10 steps down from every other market in the world you know what i mean so yeah of course it's it's a it's all about balance in life period i feel so it's just like a good balance in in not caring what the opinions of others say but also realizing that you need each and every person you encounter every day to help you and to help them progress in where we're all supposed to be at the end of the day in life yeah okay so i heard that lil wayne Somebody told me this. I'm not sure if it's true. They said that a lot of his songs are freestyle. Oh, yeah, yeah. He doesn't write. So, like... He doesn't write ever? No, nah, he doesn't. So, so this is the thing. Like, this, I'm glad we're talking about this because because it's funny. We always have this talk, like, me and my boys, like, mm-hmm. what's a freestyle and what's not these days? Because you, you know what I mean? You'll scroll down on Instagram. You'll see people with the freestyle challenges with the phone right up in their face and everything, right? So, to me, as an artist, I'm, I dictate a freestyle because I really freestyle. So... If you freestyle, right? If you pop, like, a if I asked right you, now, if I asked you, rap right now. Yeah, I could, I could drop something exactly, like huh. off the top. But that's what I consider a real freestyle. What we do sometimes as artists, like I say, I freestyle tracks, right? Mm-hmm. But that's not what I'm talking. About. I'm talking like if a beat goes on and I'm going for two minutes, that's a freestyle off the top of the head. Nothing was written. That's a freestyle. Mm-hmm. When I freestyle for a track, yeah, I, I freestyle, but I might have freestyle for twenty seconds. Listen to that twenty second clip cut it to about 15, Mm -hmm. told him to punch me in there, then freestyled again. Nothing's ever getting written down. But at the same time, I'm writing it because I have that time with the, you know, punch Mm -hmm. in and the punch out. So, so when these artists like Lil Wayne, so there's freestyling and there's raw, exact raw freestyling, you know what I mean? So when like these guys like Lil Wayne and Travis Scott and these guys are saying like, yeah, you know, I freestyle everything. I freestyle everything. It's, it's, we understand it, but a lot of the consumers don't understand it that like, that's not, that doesn't mean I just went in and freestyle for two minutes and 30 seconds and boom, there's your finished product. There's the track. You know, it all still gets like sectioned up and, you know, sliced up, mm-hmm. punched in, punched out. But what I really respect is like when someone can just pop a beat on right here and we can just sit here for like five minutes and I know that we're going to go off. Like we're really going to just go off the top of our head. No one needs to be thinking about anything. We just Do you need to be freestyle with it. Uh, not necessarily. I, I could come with some rhymes and stuff too, but I just, I, I feed off the beat so much as an artist. Like I never, I never write the stuff first. Mm-hmm. Like I could just come up with some non-capella just cause like, again, I, I didn't really start as someone who wanted to be a rapper. I just knew I could rhyme. Like I just had that poetry, like kind of instinct mm-hmm. in it. So it's just for me, the, the funnest part about being a rapper is just finding different words that rhyme together in like clever ways. So, so I can do it acapella too, but I just, mm-hmm. I really feel something in the beats and it tells me which way to take each track. Like yeah. if, it's, if the beat seems more a love song, it's probably going to lead mm-hmm. me in that way. If the beat seems like kind of more party theme, I'm probably mm-hmm. talking about some party theme shit. So, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. That's why I don't also like when people try and section off rap into like conscious rap and like this mumble shit and blah, blah, blah. Because mm-hmm. at the same time, I think like that's what I hold over other artists is, I'll, I'll jump into every single lane mm-hmm. and not like get stuck into what they tell you, like find your sound mm-hmm. and whatnot. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think you should have multiple sounds and, and people will react to it. It's not the same as it was before anyway. So people want to hear different sounds from you. They don't want to just hear like even J. Cole receives hate, you know, like, oh, it's just, oh, it's just I- too preachy. It's just too preachy. <laughs> but you know what I mean? That's because these people just want to hear one, one way of things, one yeah. way of things. It's about expanding and just like, now nah, I'm in the party mood, so I pop that party track on. But 
hey, now I'm actually went through some shit. I kind of want to feel a bit better about that. Let me hear what this guy went through so I can relate it to my situation and get past my situation. You know what I mean? But each moment just has a different set of music for it. I think that's just the hardest thing for us to categorize and put into like a Grammy category. You can't you can't split hip hop into 30 things if you want one award for best rap album. You know what I mean? I think that's what's really messing with everyone's heads with it. So. Yeah, people got opinions about everything, right? Mm-hmm. So yeah. if you had to rank your top five rappers, mm-hmm. Who are you putting on it? If I had to do like a top five, I, w- I won't put an order to him. Yeah. But I'll put, it's hard to do, honestly, but Drake for sure is in the top five for me. Nas. Mm-hmm. Uh, J. Cole for sure. Okay. So that's three, right? Drake, yeah. J. Cole, Nas. Nice. Kendrick for sure, I'll mm-hmm. put him with. And then for my fifth, it's tough. I'll put Biggie in there. And Tupac as my fit together, I'll say. Okay. Just because and then if you it's hard to, to... You have to give one more honorable mention, who would it be? Honorable mention? J. Cows. He's on his way. He's on his way. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> but yeah, Perfect. You know, it, it's tough to it's tough to compare. Like, I don't like comparing that. That's like comparing, you know, like, who's the best basketball player of all time. And, like, you know, and you get into the Jordan, LeBron, Kobe. Like, well, I have my top five. Top, you got your top five? Yeah, I got my too? top five. Yeah. It's, it's hard for me to do a top five just because, like, there's... It's it's easy to do in a position category for me when it comes to athletics, but to do it just as an overall, it's so hard for me because there's so many people are skilled in different ways. You know well, I mean? my top five is like who I would the top five players who I'd have just as a starting just lineup yeah, not as a starting lineup like how they fit together, but like the top five players that I'd have. So like I have LeBron, I got Jordan, I got Kobe, I got Curry, and oh god, I uh, I got I got <laughs> This is because I'm a huge modern ball guy. I got Durant. Yeah, Durant. I sure. got no big guys in there. But no my big guys. guys after that are Shaq, Elijah Wan, and Chamberlain. Those are my three dudes. For sure. And actually, sure. Duncan. Du- yeah, Duncan, Duncan too. Duncan's, Duncan's, Duncan's in there. But Duncan's a weird mix because in today's NBA, he'd be a center. Mm-hmm. But in the old NBA, he's a four. Like, Nowitzki, Duncan, and Garnett are... Yeah, borderline. Yeah, yeah, they could play, play four or five. For me, it's, it's just too tough, man. I just I have such just so many different favorites, like... Even Kawhi, to me, like, Kawhi, oh. the way he plays, like it's Super not, it's not Utah. recognized right now. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I just watched that game, but that's what I mean. There's certain guys, like I look back and I and I compare the the generations, and it's just like there's some players in the league right now. If they got a chance to, like, no offense to older generations, but if they got a chance to play in some of those leagues, they might be Hall of Fame players then already. Yeah. You know what I mean? And like, look at a guy like Melo who doesn't even get any love. That's one of the best basketball players of all time. I like, you know what I mean? I yeah, you know, best of Melo. Melo to me, I'm not talking as like in terms of winning you games, but I'm just talking like when I talk about best player, I always just think offensive skill, talent. Like, yeah, like, offensive talent. He's up there. Skill, but Melo yeah. to me frustrates me so much mm-hmm. because he doesn't try on defense like everybody's yeah. like well Steph's not a good defender he tries he's just not that good yeah, Westbrook yeah. to me unforgivably bad on defense I see. Yeah, it's yeah. unforgivable how bad he is because but, he's so goddamn athletic but at the same time though it's just like with that league it's just like how can you be a good defender like you know what I mean there's no help defense well, there's no yeah, it's, such yeah. a, it's such a different dynamic to me I'm just like they're set up for failure like Every play in the NBA just turns out to a switch, like you know what and I mean. And everybody in the NBA is amazing on him, exactly. And it's like everyone's unguardable. But or my they issue, were up until that point, they my issue them. is with Westbrook. There are so many possessions, like if he's guarding Curry, or he'll just he'll close out on him, and both hands are down. Mm-hmm. That is a death sentence yeah, against Stephen Curry. How can <laughs> how can you close out with play. how can, even one hand down? Like if you're not two hands up with, and like there are so many possessions where he'll just fall asleep and lose his guy. It's like. Dude, yeah, yeah, for sure. But but at the same time, man, a lot of other plates, right? Like, yeah. when, when you're an offensive superstar in the league, that's like 82 games. We expect you to do this for us. You know what I mean? So it's like sometimes you got to give up the D a bit. Like that's why you don't really see too many two way players. Cause I like, I will forgive it for LeBron because yeah. he knows how to turn it up. Exactly. Westbrook, I don't when, think when knows how to. Yeah, I don't think needed. like DeRozan didn't know how to do that shit. Mm-hmm. So when the Kawhi Leonard trade happened, I was so happy. Yeah, it worked out nice. Like I was, I was questionable about it when it first happened, but I respect it. Like it's definitely, it was definitely a good trade even for both sides. Spurs are definitely taking a little longer to see it, but it well, was, the, it was a good. Spurs trade. lost a lot of players this year. They lost. Yeah, exactly. Like Danny Green was great for them. Mm-hmm, Kyle I mean. Anderson also left, and they've had injuries. But I mean, but yeah, now they got a chance to rebuild it up, but still not necessarily just tank like you know how Philly was a couple of years ago at least. So. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure. Toronto and San Antonio will be a great matchup. Mm-hmm. Uh, sure, sure. Tomorrow, 
I mean, it'll be Thursday by the time this releases. Last week. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it'll be over. But, uh, yeah. Okay, so Jordan, we're coming down to the end of our show here. Uh, is there anything you want to leave people, plug, whatever you want? Yeah, for sure. I just want to say, uh, you know, like I'm making the transition now from SoundCloud Rapper to really putting this stuff all platforms and just pushing hard this year. So, you know, shout out to everybody who's been supporting me up until this point. And, you know, we got Bosch here coming January 18th, all platforms. Yes, sir. So, you know, I'm excited to just see how that release goes and just build the year based on that and just keep keep learning, keep growing and just keep putting the city on every day. So, yeah, you know, thanks for, for sure. having me. Mama. Yeah, of course, man. This is great. I really enjoyed it. Anyways, guys, thank you so much for listening to us this week. We are back on regular schedule for one episode a week. Enjoy the new year. Happy 2019. 2019 is going to be your year. Everybody's year. Yes, you gotta, sir. Got to yes, start sir. speaking that into existence. Shoot your shot. Shoot your shot 2019 because shoot or shoot. You already know. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Oh, fuck. Exactly. Have a great week. Have a great year. And here we are signing off.